Well, for those of you who don't know me, which is all of you, my name's Wayne Byrne. I describe myself as an independent researcher with no academic or any other affiliations. So, all agendas are mine. First of all, I'm going to give you a quick overview of my main theory of gravity and electromagnetic repulsion. Newton assumed when he considered gravity that space was a vacuum. But we now know that to be untrue. Space is a plasma. It's full of charged particles and plasmas like liquids and gases are fluids. So I say we treat space as a fluid medium. And every astronomical body from the largest star to the smallest meteoroid as a solid body completely immersed in a fluid medium. Thus, gravity now becomes a matter of simple fluid dynamics. The plasma will, following the second law of thermodynamics, attempt to lower its energy state in the only way possible by occupying the space currently occupied by the body. So you get a force, a simple force, surface pressure all around. The presence of other bodies will affect the gravity. It's simple Newtonian mechanics, but I'm using volume rather than mass. Because, as I'll show you in a bit, volume is much better than mass. It correlates a lot better. So all you have to remember, really, is that space is just pushing everything together, just following the second law of thermodynamics. But if everything gets pushed together, there's going to be nothing left. So we balance this up with a system of mutual electromagnetic repulsion between two astronomical bodies that are connected by a Birkeland current. Here, this is what happens after planetary genesis. A planet emerges. In the core is emplaced a colossal amount of charge. And I mean colossal, 10 to the 18 amps. And that's an awful lot. This means that we have a highly charged core and a surface with low potential. The Birkeland currents will form in response to this so that they can equalize out the potential. They will form at the poles because that's on a slightly flattened oblate spheroid. That will be the, least, the path of least resistance for the current. So they will go from the northern hemisphere and one from the southern hemisphere and they distribute charge to equalize it all out within the body. Now these currents are essential for solar system formation because they connect to other planets like this. The two planetary cores will have a potential difference. So the connections will be formed at the equatorial regions, as shown. And without going into electromagnetism, that system ensures that those two planets can never ever come into contact. It's automatic magnetic repulsion. And when we start to build solar systems, here's a very simple system. Three inner planets and the sun. The term SCD at the top is surface charge density. It's a convenient term for today. It's an incomplete term, but it works. The higher a body's surface charge density, the more repulsion power it has. And the further away from its parent sun, the higher will be its SCD, because the sun will repel it even further out. The sun connects to all of its planets, in turn, according to their SCD, as shown. Each of the planets will be daisy-chained to their immediate inside and outside neighbours. Planets and satellites work in the same way. Whether it's a moon or a ring, all satellites will be daisy-chained to their parent planet. Planets to the parent sun and the electoral hierarchy goes up to a higher SCD star and an even higher etc. Now these Birkeland currents are a series of concentric counter-rotating layers of current filaments. This is actually a cross-section of the lightning bolt model from last year. It's now slightly out of date, but uh, it works. The outside layer will rotate 
clockwise, the next one anti-clockwise, etc. Another thing of Birkeland currents is their quirky spatial geometry. They're cylinders, so if you connect two bodies with a cylindrical current, one end will, will appear to rotate clockwise, while the other end will rotate anti-clockwise. I say that it is the outer layer of Birkeland currents that is responsible for a planet's axial rotation. In this case, although the current is rotating in a clockwise direction, planet one will rotate clockwise, but planet two will rotate anti-clockwise. Now, incorporating these into the solar system model, you can assemble the solar system starting with the parent sun's axial rotation and working on and through the planets to get something like these. This is the heliosphere, the top diagram of the inner planets up to and including the asteroid belt and Jupiter. And the lower one are the outer planets. The current layers are stacked vertically with the most powerful at the top, near the core of the current, and the least powerful ones at the bottom. As you see here with Mercury, that will use this weaker current layer to connect to Venus to repel it, and its stronger current layer will connect back to the Sun, which feeds the current. Venus has to repel both the Earth and its Moon, and Venus before it links back to the Sun. Venus must go back to the Sun from the top A to the Sun's C, which means that the three currents below it force Venus into having a clockwise axial rotation. The Moon is shown on both sides of the Earth because as it revolves around, it must connect with both Venus and with Mars's outer moon, Deimos, which it's forced to repel. If you go up to somewhere like Saturn, you will see that all the outer satellites, they've all been aggregated together, just to simplify it. So Saturn's bottom connection of A will be to its innermost moon and the next day to its outermost moon. And as you will see also, Uranus and Pluto have clockwise axial rotations, just as they do up there. Now, if either any of these outer planets have one moon or ring, more or less, then that will change their axial rotation. And as there are about 200 moons and rings, I think I'm doing pretty well with this model so far. It stacks up and predicts the anomalous clockwise axial rotations. But what else can it do? We'll have to look at solar systems, but just to show you how planets daisy chain their satellites, the first two moons will always have the same axial rotation as the parent planet, and after that they will alternate. The asteroid belt is shown as having two regions. Initially, that says it can have three, four, five, whatever. The only connections that will change will be in the middle. Jupiter in this outer moon and Mars and Deimos, it won't make any difference to their connections. So the asteroid belt could have three, four, five different regions, which is in line with the thinking behind the Kirkwood gaps, I would say. So that's the asteroid belt as it is now. That's the full heliosphere, both northern and southern hemispheric currents. All nice and neat, rather like a set of nested toruses that just spin around inside each other. It's not quite as simple as that when it's all in motion, but that's the full wiring diagram. This, I suggest, is an ideal solar system under both the accretion disk theory and mine. You'll have a sun with the rocky planets closer, then the ice giants, and then the gas giants. But ours doesn't look anything like that. Here is the plot of the surface gravity against volume for our solar system members. 
a nice straight line with Mercury, Earth and Jupiter. If you plot the masses, you'll find a curve. On this graph, if you want to stick to basics and plot a, a line with two, two intersects points and one adjacent as a minimum, you cannot put a curve on that set of points. And the same for the, the mass plot, you cannot put a straight line on the mass plot. The mass plot gives an exponential function, which is probably useful over about two to three orders of magnitude, which is why we find once we get further out, gravity starts to uh, fall apart. Now, there's five outliers there. I've taken the projections up from their points to show where they would be in relative positions. If the sun is at naught, the axis, and Jupiter's up there, the ice giants will be between the rocky planets and the gas giants. But those three are way, way, way out of place. It doesn't matter whether you plot mass, the same things occur, the same outliers. So what can we do about that? Well, this is where the Saturn hypothesis comes in. It seems to be the only alternative offered offered to explain the recent history of our solar system and why our planets are such a hodgepodge. I'm sure you all know enough about the Saturn hypothesis to uh, stop me running through it all. But I'm going to test it using my solar system model. So the first thing we need to do is to establish the two original systems, the Sol system and the Saturn system. For the Sol system, I've just taken the axial rotation of, the, of our Sun as an anti-clockwise and fitted the rest in as they would be, the current connections. The Saturnian system, well, that's a little more difficult. There are eight possible current configurations for the original Saturn system. This was the one I tried first instinctively. And I played around with the others, and for reasons which I'll explain later, discarded them and went with this. I've included the moon for two reasons. One is that our moon is what I would call a natural moon, or a fully differentiated planetary body, but on a smaller scale, as opposed to irregular moons that are more likely to be the result of capture such as Mars's Deimos and Phobos. That's why they're not on there, because they would have come from the resultant mayhem I'm about to explain. Also, the earliest records of the Moon we have are lunar cycles carved on bone, which were found in France, 64, somewhere like that. Alexander Marchek translated the cycles, and they were dated at 32,000 BC which would fit in with the proposed timeline I have in mind. I've included Venus in the Saturn system because I find the explanation of Venus being a piece of plasma spat out by Saturn to be profoundly unscientific, really, and just a little ridiculous, to be perfectly honest. So I've put it in there, as it would be in the equatorial lineup that Dave Talbot and others have proposed. So there are our two systems. So what happens when we point the Saturn system at the Sol system, set the controls for the heart of the Sun, and push the big red button? First, the Saturn system will enter the Sun's heliosphere. The Sun will connect to it with Birkeland currents, just as it would any other threat to system stability, such as a comet or anything like that. So as Saturn's moving across this heliosphere in the outer regions, it will still be a brown dwarf. It will still have its plasma sheath, which, like other substellar objects, will be more ultraviolet than infrared. As the Saturn system moves through the heliosphere, it's going to encounter an increased gravitational field. The first effect will be 
to slightly compress the Saturn system. There won't be a great compression because the gravity is more acting, pushing the whole thing towards the sun rather than compressing the system. That's much slower. It's like, in my theory, I say that all planets are formed as gas giants initially and gravity acts over time to compress them down to ice giants and then down into rocky planets. And they will just progress towards the sun like that, forming our nice little idealized solar system we saw earlier. But here, the moon is much smaller and that will be pushed further towards the sun by gravity. So the moon is going to stretch out away from the earth. At this point, we still can't see it because we're in a brown dwarf. All we have is ultraviolet light. Nothing's visible, really. So we still can't see the moon. The second effect is that once the system is inside of Jupiter's orbit, the increased gravitational pressure will put more pressure on the plasma sheath. And this is what the plasma sheaths do. They are superheated under gravity. If you have a sun, you have a massive volume, massive gravity. That plasma sheath is really superheated under pressure to the point where we get a yellow dwarf. With Saturn being so close, when its plasma sheath does light up, warms up, it will appear as a yellow dwarf. Really close, just as in this polar configuration image of Dave Tolbert's. And there is Earth's first sun, Saturn, the best sun, the prime sun, etc. I'm sure you all know the references. Well, why all the currents connections to the sun are being arranged? The system will be held in an equatorial line. So you will have this image line up for quite a long period while all the current connections from the Sun to Mars, Venus, Earth, Saturn are being made. So you're going to hold them up in what is effectively a world axis with Saturn at the celestial pole. At the other end of the sky, there is a spectacular light show. These are the familiar Squatterman images of Tony Peratt. And these will be seen in the sky as the Sun and Mercury form a connection to Earth. We'll see those, we would see those if we're alive then, in the sky as the Sun mainly will connect to Earth and Mercury. You won't see it on the Saturn image because the Earth to Mars connection is already established. But you will see the Sun and Mercury forming new ones and they will be the source of the Squatterman and other images of plasma discharges. So when the sun's integrated, what's it look like current-wise? Here we are with all the planets integrated. And the first thing we should notice is that Saturn now has a clockwise axial rotation. That has undergone a full reversal of its axial rotation. It wouldn't have happened when Saturn first connected to the Sun as a comet. It would have happened later on its second connection when all the current connections with the rest of the system are being made. And Saturn's connection to the Sun is a, a C, so it will change its axial rotation. As the system is in motion, when this happens, the whole system I suggest we'll tilt over as one. This would explain the current similar axial rotations of Saturn, Mars and Earth. Don't worry about Venus yet. She has a little adventure of her own anyway. The other effect of this axial tilt is that Earth, which would act like our moon in a solar eclipse, would cast a pale shadow over the whole of Saturn. But once you tilt the system, Earth, Mars and Venus will be above the equatorial axis. 
Then you get sunlight coming through from Sol and illuminating a bright crescent at the bottom of Saturn. I like that. Of course, this is a northern hemispheric view. If you're in the southern hemisphere, the crescent will be at the top. Now, Dave Talbot's assembled lots of images with the crescents at the bottom, the top, and at both sides. But that's the main one. When I had a look through all the images, most of the references appeared to be for the crescent at the bottom and at the side. Very few at the top. But uh, that's a question of geographical distribution. I mean, un unless someone can link up individual images with their geographical origins, you couldn't say. So now we have the golden age of Saturn. A sun at either end of the sky. The moon is far away from Earth, caught between two suns. We still can't see it. In this golden age, the vegetation on Earth will grow profusely. You're now introducing more infrared as opposed to UV. UV is good for vegetation growth, for bulk growth, but you do need the infrared for flowering plants. So this golden age, there will be a resource abundance. Everyone's needs are easily catered for. Food is everywhere. On the vine or on the hoof, it's everywhere. You don't need to worry about anything. But not everything in the garden is rosy. And events are already underway that will send this demi-paradise crashing through the seven gates of hell. Let's take a closer look at Venus. Here from an equatorial view, which we wouldn't see, you can see the powerful connecting currents from Saturn, which are constantly electrically machining Venus. This gives the bright, radiant star. As these currents are equatorial, the erosion is going to be on the equatorial regions. This will lead to the pronounced equatorial scarring we see on Venus today, and it will also explain Venus's almost spherical orbit, as the equator is going from an oblate spheroid machined down to a sphere. Now it will have a spherical orbit. It doesn't have that imbalance of weight that an oblate spheroid does. This goes on for some time, and it will strip away layers and layers of Venus's crust, leaving Venus much hotter than we thought, a thin crust means less pressure on the mantle, so you get extensive volcanic activity. You also, with strip crust, you're going to expose the hydrocarbons which are at depth. So that's Venus's hydrocarbons explained, spherical orbit explained, and what else was it? Oh, uh, volcanic activity, yes. All that from Venus's time there. Now, although the planets are held in a straight conjunction on a world axis, the bits of Venus will spread out in an orbital direction. Just like that. They will be held there by Mars and Saturn repelling them from both sides. And now you have an asteroid belt. And thus, the seeds of destruction are sown. And now we move on to Act Two of this little cosmic drama, the fall of Saturn. We'll start like this. As soon as the currents are all in place, that will be our lineup. And the first thing that does, that will happen, Saturn will begin to move out because it has an SCD much closer to Jupiter's than where it is there. So Venus will follow. Mars, unfortunately, is now trapped by the asteroid belt. It can't move through it. All movement in solar systems is equatorial. 
because the currents are equatorial, everything revolves around an equatorial plane. So Mars can't move. The connecting current between Mars and Venus is going to come under severe electrical stress. It needs to be maintained so the Sun will be pouring charge onto Mars and through to Venus to maintain that connection. So they will be in glow mode and this will probably, possibly, be the source of Dave Talbot's images for the White Crown of Egypt where you see the current stretching out in glow mode between Mars and Venus and also for the Red Crown of course. And there are probably an awful lot more such images, but I just chose these. So as Venus and Saturn move out, they will appear to rise in the sky because they're moving outwards. Mars, stranded behind the asteroid belt, can't move out. So Mars will appear to descend down to the bottom of the crescent, giving rise to images of the bull of heaven, the mountain of heaven, Kali's tongue, and an Aztec deity whose name escapes me because I can't pronounce it. But they are the plasma discharges you will see from Mars as, the, as it moves away and its connection with Earth comes under stress. So it will move down, and now you have perfect images. It may be right, I think it links up quite nicely. And now, we continue. Saturn has formed a connection with Uranus, but now Saturn moves out. Neptune has a much higher SCD than Uranus, as does Saturn. So between the two of them, they're going to squeeze Uranus out to one side. The current will be in glow mode. I've taken liberties with the colour red, as you'll see shortly. As this continues, Saturn will move towards Jupiter, pushing Uranus and Neptune further out, both connecting currents in glow mode. Only Jupiter is higher than all of them and will repel Neptune even further out than Uranus. As they continue, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune will arc all the way around Jupiter until they get to their current orbits. During this time, Uranus is going to be stuck between Saturn and Neptune, both with higher SCD values and both constantly bombarding it from either side. And Jupiter will join in as they arc around. So Uranus suffers quite a battering. And on it will go. Until you finally You'll have them all lined up and they will just slot in beyond Jupiter and occupy their current orbits. Another way to view this sequence is from Earth. A powerful image. And a very central theme, as you all know, of Saturn devouring his children. That's why I coloured them in red, just to make them look like umbilical cords. Artistic licence. And that's what you would have seen in the night sky. Three planets moving around, spawning endless child sacrificial cults of El, Moloch and other Canaanite deities. And all in some vain attempt to appease Saturn to come back and return with his golden age by sacrificing their own children. Such is the way of the world. Let's have a look how this checks out, current-wise. This is time for the, the final act, the dragon's roar. And enter Venus, the beautiful princess, with a dark secret. After the fall of Saturn, 
Venus will be forced to connect with Jupiter, which having a much higher SCD will push Venus back towards the asteroid belt. And Venus must now make a connection to the asteroid belt so it can repel it. In doing so, Venus now undergoes a full reversal of its axial rotation and becomes clockwise. But Venus can't stay out here past the asteroid belt. She is simply too small to carry enough surface charge to maintain a position out there. So what does Venus do? It doesn't have many choices, but one thing it will start to do is to wobble and spiral. Again, possible sources of imagery. So Venus can't stay out there. The other three exiles, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, will have had massive amounts of charge poured on them from the Sun to maintain their positions outside of Jupiter. I added Pluto at this point, not for any particular reason, but I suspect it would have been a moon of either Uranus or Neptune originally. And in the chaos and mayhem, it was acquired by the Sun as a planet. And you also see that as well as Venus, Uranus and Neptune have also had a full reversal of their axial rotations. But in all the chaos and mayhem of the electrical exchanges, I don't think they would have made much difference. But Uranus would have suffered the most. And that's why Uranus has a very extreme axial tilt. So what is Venus going to do? Venus has a choice. She can either ascend above the asteroid belt or descend below it on her way back to the sun. She chose to grow up to rise above. Whatever circumstances dictate. And this is her initial flight path. As she is forced back to the asteroid belt, she still has connections to Mars and Jupiter. And as can be seen, the northern hemispheric connection to Mars provides the shortest electrical path. So most of the charge that Venus is trying to dump onto Mars will go via the northern hemispheric current. Which is why Mars has a much thinner crust on its northern hemisphere on its than on its southern one. If Venus had chosen to go below the asteroid belt, it would have been reversed and the southern hemisphere would be thinner. Venus will pass extremely close to Mars, extremely close. So that raises the possibility of not only thunderbolts creating features like Olympus Mons, but a huge electric arc capable of carving out Valles Marineris. Because Venus would have been very close and very highly charged. When Venus eventually gets past the asteroid belt, then her connections are going to start breaking up. Connections to Jupiter will go, and as she moves past Mars, then her connections to Mars will go, because the Sun now has to rearrange all of its current connections to accommodate that. So without any connections, Venus is a rogue planet. No connections to the Sun, no connections to anywhere. Threatens system stability, so the Sun treats it as it would a comet. And this is when Venus becomes a comet for a short time. She will be huge, massive in the sky, absolutely massive. And she will light up into one large blue fiery dragon. As she turns from Mars to Earth, Earth has a higher SCD than Mars, so we'll be able to keep Venus a little further away than Mars. But you're not going to get any electric arcs, but you are going to get a lot of the dragon's fiery breath. 
The exposed hydrocarbons in Venus's thin crust, ignited by powerful electric discharges, will now rain down upon paradise in rivers of burning oil. Before she passes over and moves towards the sun, and it is now time for the princess to lift her veil and reveal her dark and terrible secret. She is the first dragon, mother of all dragons, the biggest fiery beast that has ever been seen. But that's not the, quite the end. As she passes Earth, the sun now has to accommodate Venus between Mercury and Earth. Which means that Earth's connection to the Sun now moves up one. And Earth will, as in the original heliosphere diagrams, now have an anti-clockwise axial rotation. And when Venus moves in there, the Earth will suffer a complete reversal of its axial rotation. This, I say, is Velikovsky's elusive doomsday event. As you know, there are plenty of historical references to this from Herodotus onwards. To the Egyptian Empire, stretching from when the sun was in one part of the sky to another one, etc., etc. What happens when we get a full reversal of axial rotation? I suggest you're going to have volcanic and seismic activity everywhere. All at the same time. It really is going to look like the end of the world. The world's oceans will stop and lay waste to their western shores before streaming back in a full ocean tsunamis to lay waste to their eastern seaboards, as will every other body of water on the planet. And this is the hellish nightmare that mankind locked up in a little box and buried it so deep within our collective psyche that Jung and Velenkovsky were only able to prise open the lid a little and get a small glimpse of the horrors inside. I'm sure you all have thoughts of your own on the doomsday event, etc. So I'll only mention a couple of things. If you were wandering about as one of the survivors of this global apocalypse, and you came upon a scene like Pompeii, and there would have been many, you could be forgiven for thinking that the snake-dressed goddess who flew across the sky a few days earlier had simply looked down and turned the people to stone. And I say that's the origin of the Gorgon's petrifying gaze. It fits in very nicely. And if no one's claimed it, I am. <laughs> secondly, if the Earth captured the Moon when it was part of the Saturn system, then as we've seen with the earlier analysis, you capture a moon and your axial rotation is going to jump up one and change. So at some time in the past, it could have been tens, hundreds, millions of years ago, Earth, I say, suffered another full reversal. I've tried to raise this point with geologists as regards global tectonics, and nobody has got any thoughts on the possibilities of a full reversal of axial rotation. Mainstream science simply won't accept it, and there is no work at all on it. But I think that such an event will be capable of widening ocean basins, if not opening them up. I could be wrong. I'm not a geologist. The other thing I'd like to mention is that when this doomsday event occurred, you would have had a society that had been built on a baseline of permanent resource abundance that suddenly came crashing down to a baseline of resource scarcity. 
How does society cope with that? This is the problem. When you have resource scarcity, you have to acquire those resources. And you have to learn to lie, to deceive, to cheat, to steal, and if necessary, to kill, in order to secure those resources. And going from a position of abundance, where everyone was nice and happy and everything was rosy in the garden, you will get an immediate descent into barbarism. A traumatized, scattered population will become isolated bands. Bands will become tribes. And the stage is set for resource wars. Lots and lots of them. Until conflict becomes an accepted way of life and violence the natural way of resolving it. So you can take an awful lot of our evils all the way back to there, in my opinion. And that is it. <laughs> Thanks very much.